I wanted to thank Mr. Bishop Michael and Father John for inviting me to speak here in this lecture series and uh, to tell you how humbled I am to stand here as a graduate of St. Tichon's and who, somebody who remembers the lecture series of my years, graduated a long time ago, but uh, the lecture series was one of those highlights of the academic year, in the beginning of the academic year, when various speakers would come and would have these wonderful talks and gave us food for thought and so something to discuss. So I'm really humbled to be here, Father, and uh, also humbled by the topic. You know, the current science says that it took about 14 billion years for the universe to get into the state that it's in right now. The story of creation talks about God doing all of this in six days. And I have to do this in a little bit over an hour. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, I'll do my best, but uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, can everybody hear me well? And can everybody see the screen? I was uh, very happy that we have this opportunity to have slideshow presentation because my talk uh, might be, some of you will be familiar with what I have to say, especially I see there are some of uh, those present here who actually attended my class at the Deacon's program in Philadelphia, so you might um, uh, know some of what I'm going to share with you, but I will have a lot of information to share. And I hope that the slideshow presentation will help to somehow process this a little bit better. So my first question is for you. Anybody knows what this is? Mm. Neurons. Neurons, yes? Yeah. Wow, great. So you have scientific <laughs> background yourself. Very good. Anybody knows what this is? Cosmic background What's that? Yeah, close, Father, close. <laughs> I see that you studied astrophysics. <laughs> map of the universe. Well, that map of the universe is exactly right. Uh, the scientists, as they were discovering new galaxies and measuring the distances to those galaxies from our perspective, were trying to put together what does it look like on a really large scale. And uh, they realized at first that the galaxies actually are not spread throughout the universe kind of, you know. When you ring that bell, everybody wants to eat. <laughs> 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 uh, so what they realized is that the galaxies actually line up in a certain kind of a web-type structure. Uh, and uh, what we see here are actually uh, collections of galaxies that are kind of have, some of them are gathered in clusters of galaxies, some of them uh, kind of stretch along these lines that are connecting these clusters, but I thought this would be very interesting to compare the two seemingly very different, distinct uh, structures and to ask the question, what's going on on a major scale in the universe that makes it look like a brain? <coughs> the science doesn't have a clue of why it's happening. But this is what uh, recent studies, and I'm talking about the recent decade, has been able to reveal. So what we're looking at is the structure that is maybe about 500 million light years across. So our galaxy is 100,000 light years. It means the light travels from one side of the galaxy to another in 100,000 years. The distance to the closest Andromeda galaxy, it's not, like, not the closest galaxy, but the closest large galaxy like ours is about 2 million light years. So we're looking at here as about 500 million. Uh, huge space, but the structures that are emerging are just fascinating. And uh, tells you that the science actually is very far from answering very important questions. So I'm myself fascinated by the similarity between the neurons and the structure of the galaxy. So that's just like a little uh, prelude to what I have to share with you. So in this talk, what I would like to, to, to do is to talk a little bit about the current uh, picture of how the universe, according to the current model of science, developed. 
then talk about some challenges that are remaining, not only in astrophysics, but also in biology and the questions of evolution. But then I hope to spend some considerable time with you talking about the actual biblical text. Because the challenge right now, I think, for all of us is to kind of be able to put together what we currently know in science and what we read in the actual biblical <coughs> text of the first chapter of Genesis. So the current picture of the universe, the Big Bang, this is the microwave background radiation that Father Ignatius mentioned. Um, the scientists, after the theory of relativity of Einstein, started to measure things. They realized the universe is expanding, which was a result of the original expansion of the universe that is sort of ongoing. But originally, the universe started pretty much from zero, uh, the size of atom that had the mass of all that matter that is right now. At a certain point, about 14 billion years ago, this particle exploded. And when we usually say Big Bang, we think about explosion in space, but it's not actually correct because it's explosion of space itself. So we're thinking about the universe ex expanding as a, as a space, not as a particle in space. And it's very hard to picture, but if you are in this expanding universe, in, wherever you are, you will see that everything is expanding from you. So if you are in our galaxies, all the galaxies run away from you. If you are in Andromeda galaxies, all the galaxies run away from you as well. So it's expanding, expansion of the three-dimensional space. And uh, uh, the original state of the universe was pretty much elementary particles. And they've emitted a certain radiation that we still can detect as a microwave radiation. At first, it was thought of to be kind of a uniform. Wherever you would look, you would see the same intensity of radiation. When they were able to recently uh, do some scans with the satellites with more precision, they recognized, realized that there was actually fluctuations. So those fluctuations represent the original distribution of mass, that there are some spaces that are sort of empty, there are spaces that are filled with mass, which become, will become future galaxies. Uh, but we can see some of that uh, in this kind of a slice of three-dimensional picture. So this is a two-dimensional slice of three-dimensional picture. So this is a little diagram of what I'm talking about. So the Big Bang, about 14 billion years ago, expansion of the universe. Expansion was so fast, actually it exceeded the speed of light. Talking about the expansion of space. And what, the, the reason why it was necessary is not to allow for the universe to be homogenized, uh, because the, uh, uh, the interaction is uh, between the matter goes with the speed of light. Because it was expanding faster than that, there were those chunks that did not get mixed with other chunks. And this is how we have the current uh, distribution of matter that we have in the universe. So what happened after that it was that uh, uh, there were no stars for quite a while. The matter was uh, uh, just floating. Uh, it started to coalesce at a certain point. But it took about 300 uh, years, 300,000 years, for the first stars to appear. So we're talking about a certain time in the universe that the uh, scientists refer to as dark ages when there was no actual visible light because there were no stars to emit that light. Then the first stars coalesced, and they were known as quasars, the huge stars with the masses of millions of our sun. And those stars uh, exploded as supernovas uh, and uh, became the centers of the galaxies that we have right now. In those galaxies, new stars were formed, and... Uh, uh, there was a certain process. So this is the kind of an image of a quasar, the, the, side, the, the kind of artist's rendition of it, uh, that became basically, that would become the core of a future galaxy. So what happens is that when the quasar is exploded, it scattered its matter around the space, uh, which became uh, the matter from which new generation of stars would be formed. And what was interesting is that in the, in the stars themselves, a certain process is called nuclear fusion will start taking place. So now suns is, 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 is going on. This is what gives us light and, 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 and warmth. It's a fusion reaction where the lighter en uh, elements, uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, become fused together 
because of the huge pressure that you have in the center of the, of the stars. Um, and those elements fuse, uh, fuse into heavier elements and so forth. So what we have right now in the universe is a periodic table of elements was the process that was taking place in the stars. Now, as those stars uh, would go through a certain reaction, they would explode as novas or supernovas and scatter the matter that they, they had inside of them into these nebulae that would become the grounds from which future generations of stars would form. And so our star, Sun, is many, many generations of stars from the formation of the universe. And what's interesting is that um, original stars were mostly hydrogen, they were light elements. By the time our sun appears, there is enough of those heavier elements present in the universe to allow for the formation of Earth like ours, the planet on which we stand, which are the heavier elements, iron and, uh, and others. Uh, so we have also enough solar system gas giants, yes, but the heavier elements, they're closer to the sun and uh, we're able to form planets like ours, Venus, uh, Mars, Mercury. So this is the process that was taking place before something like our Earth could appear. And this is um, the kind of position of our star, Sun, in reference to the center of our galaxy. So the center of the galaxy where the quasar used to be is right there. We are in one of the arms of the... Um, of, of, of our galaxy, which we call Milky Way galaxy. Are you able to see the screen well? Yes. So the stars would form from uh, these nebulae that uh, would have the matter coalesce both in the star itself, but also in the planets that would be going around it. And then our Earth, once it was formed, was first very hot, uh, then it cooled down, uh, allowed for the formation of plants. Now, how the organic life comes to be is still a mystery to the scientists. Obviously, they say, well, it has to be uh, some kind of process, and they usually would say it's a lot of accidental mutations that end up uh, bringing something like a vegeta vegetable life. Then we all know this from a, a course in biology in school, yes, the first animals, and then you have the extinction events, which you kind of clear the ground for the future animals, and so forth, and we uh, kind of come to the tree of life, the evolutionary tree from which ultimately man would emerge. So I think we know this picture quite well. What this picture shows is the actual connection in the structure of the DNA that all the living beings share. So we have something in, uh, in common with vertebrates, with fish. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's obviously would be one of the talking points for those who would say that uh, the story of creation is a total nonsense and that we see this connection. Therefore, um, it was not uh, what, what we have as a biological uh, beings uh, were not connected separately. They were actually connected with each other. So, this is the current picture. It seems like the scientists have it down pretty well. Um, but once you start studying science, you realize that there are other uh, very interesting things that have not been, uh, there's still a need of answer. And uh, also you realize that, especially the physics of the 20th century, um, created uh, a lot of similarities between the picture of the development of the universe and actually the biblical story. Something that uh, science in the 19th century actually didn't understand and didn't know as well as we do now. So what are the kind of align, alignments between the biblical account and the story of development of the universe that we see now? First and very important was that there was a beginning of the universe. In 19th century science, there was no such concept. Newtonian physics would describe kind of a static space and time in which things flowed and developed, but there is no actual beginning. The theory of relativity 
came up to this very interesting conclusion that about 14 billion years ago, the universe actually began, which is huge. It's not something that was uh, uh, clear and uh, is the result of scientific research. Another interesting is that there were dark ages. Yes, there was darkness before the light. Just like in the first uh, chapter of Genesis, we hear that the earth was invisible and, uh, and void. And then God said, let there be light. The formation of, the, of life actually also took a certain process, had certain stages that line up with a biblical account. First there were plants, then there were fish, birds, reptiles, and then there were mammals and a human being. So I think it's very interesting how would those ancient people that supposedly composed the story of creation as a myth would, uh, would know some of these details that are coming uh, to light in the, in the modern science. There's also very interesting another aspect of uh, theory of relativity is that time is actually relative. Um, that's why it's called relativity. What's interesting is that, uh, you know, in light of these debates that people quite often have with the story of creation, saying, well, you know, what kind of nonsense is this to say that God created the world in six 24 hour days? Um, you know, we know that the universe is about 14 some billion years old. But theory of relativity is actually showing that time is relative. And then in one system, time can uh, flow differently than another system. So the kind of a little illustration here of how you can calculate this time dilation. And that, for example, if you have somebody moving with speed that's approaching the speed of light, for them time will flow slowly, slower. So that something that takes on Earth maybe a million years, if you fly fast enough, can be just a few seconds or a few minutes. It kind of brings to your mind this quote from Apostle Peter, with God, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. So the question about uh, the days of creation being a stumbling block, I think should be um, you know, swept aside uh, with the understanding of relativity of time. I will come back to this question of the days of creation a little bit later on in the talk and come at it from a different perspective. But I just wanted to bring this up, just in case if you are confronted with this uh, by anybody that you know who is doubting the story of creation as having six days, um, let's say, well, you know, science, science has something to say about it. But what are the problems with the current scientific understanding? And I'm emphasizing the word current scientific understanding because science changes. In the 19th century, there was a very famous scientist, Lord Kelvin. And if any of you have worked with thermodynamics or even in biology, uh, you know about Kelvin degrees, yes? Degrees of Kelvin uh, from, from, from a zero, point zero, where everything kind of stops. All the motion of molecules and, and atoms stop. That zero Kelvin, and then uh, uh, there's like it's a kind of absolute scale of temperature. Uh, he said something at the middle of the 19th century that uh, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. <laughs> All that remains is more and more precise measurements. So what he was saying basically, don't expect to, get, to have some kind of earth-shattering discoveries after Newton described everything so well. Uh, all that you need to do right now is to be good engineers. You can do, build good trains, good factories, but don't expect something to change the way that we understand that the world uh, functions. And by the way, a lot of push for atheism that you see in the beginning of the 20th century was based on Newtonian physics uh, as something that nobody doubted, not even Lord Kelvin would doubt that Newtonian physics is it. Only in the beginning of the 20th century, this man Albert Einstein comes around and just turns everything upside down. Soon after him, the quantum theory was also developed that uh, brings totally different understanding to the universe on a smaller scales, on the scales of the quantum uh, interactions. 
So the question is, is there a possibility that we might be looking at the new theory sometimes in the future? Because there are so many substantial holes in the understanding of the development of the universe that we have right now. And if we go back to the slide of uh, Big Bang, you notice that at the very end, so the universe has been expanding all this, all this time, but now expansion it seems to be accelerating. The scientists don't have explanation for that except to say that, well, there has to be some kind of invisible energy, and the energy that we still don't understand and don't know about, but it's responsible for this acceleration. They call it dark energy. Something still to be discovered. The motion of the stars in the galaxies don't really correspond to the calculations as they should be. And uh, uh, as a result, the scientists talk about dark matter. That there is something that is invisible that doesn't interact with the regular matter, not even in the sense of emitting light, but that we can see, we can, ex we can feel through the gravitational pull that that dark matter is, is exerting. And actually, according to some calculations, most of the universe, in, most of the matter in the universe is dark matter. It's about 80% of all the, all the matter that exists, according to these calculations. Uh, it's quite possible, and the scientists are looking at the fact that maybe there was something else in the universe, another theory that we have to come up with. So what we have right now is this even age of the universe. Maybe 100 years from now, people will say, well, it's, it's different. It's not the same. Uh, so we have that kind of a footnote that we always have to make as we're talking about the discoveries of science. But what about the biology itself? Um, and here I have to say that I'm not as good with paleontology as I was physics, but uh, there are some things that I think we do need to um, be mindful of, kind of bring our attention to. Fossil dating. Uh, we usually hear about carbon dating, dating that is based on the decay of the certain radioactive, radioactive elements that are part of our being, and uh, they usually say, well, we can detect certain uh, uh, the age of, of a certain uh, fossil by looking at how much of that carbon that emits radiation is still remaining. The problem with this, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, the carbon dating is not reliable after about 10,000 year old fossil, or uh, over 10,000 year old fossil. So when they're looking at the fossils, of, for example, of dinosaurs, they are actually looking at the sedimentary layers. <laughs> Uh, this is the picture of the Grand Canyon. And uh, we can see clearly the sedimentary layers that are actually part of the uh, geology of, 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 of Earth. Everywhere you see this, you drive on the highway. And uh, wherever they would uh, dig up uh, a passageway, you would see the sedimentary layers. The scientists kind of calculated the speed with which the sedimentary layers would be accumulated. So what happens when they find a fossil somewhere here, on, the, on a, certain, a certain depth, a uh, fossil of a certain species of a dinosaur, they say, well, uh, since we know how long it would take to accumulate this, this many layers above, this is how we can date uh, the age of this fossil. I'm not sure how many of you watched the movie, uh, Is Genesis History? There was a documentary that might still be on Netflix if any of you years, and I would, I would recommend that you watch it. Uh, I'm not... Uh, uh, saying that everything in that, in the documentary is everything that I agree with, but uh, they do have a very interesting, do make a very interesting point. What if the flood, the great flood described in the Bible, did actually happen? And the flood that would cover the whole earth, that flood could be responsible for the creation, a rapid creation of sedimentary layers that could be laid one on top of the other very quickly in a matter of month or a year, and what we see is not gradual accumulation that would happen over millions of years, but something that is very, very rapid. Uh, if that is the case, then the uh, dead bodies of animals that would be killed in the process of the flood would, could be deposited pretty much anywhere, because some of them would be floating. And uh, uh, interesting fact is that there are some fossils of dinosaurs that actually found on the on top surface. There are some fossils that are found in the depth, in the mines. There are some fossils that you can actually go into your backyard and find, uh, which the scientists usually will explain as erosion. So you have accumulation, and then you have erosion. 
and uh, there is a certain uncomfortable feeling that I have about science that can just simply uh, write off some evidence that we have just because we already, already have a preconceived notion of how the world uh, was formed. Now, the usual uh, argument against the, uh, the, the picture of the flood is that there isn't enough water in the, in, in, in the earth, on the earth, to cover all the highest mountains. Uh, it's kind of a valid argument. I think that's why some people, even people that are believing people studying the Bible, sometimes talk about the flood as being like a local event. Somewhere in Mesopotamia, it flooded so much that only some people survived in the ark, but it actually wasn't a global flood because it's just physically impossible. Um, about five years, four years ago, there was a new discovery published. It actually wasn't, it didn't kind of make any waves. The scientists uh, have been doing some seismic uh, testing of sound waves as they're going through the, uh, through the earth. So if you have an earthquake somewhere in Japan and you measure the seismic wave here, you can determine what layers of material it went through. And uh, to their surprise, they found that deep in the Earth's mantle, about 700 kilometers under the surface, there are great deposits of water. And when they started to calculate, it turns out that under our crust, we have a water uh, more than three times the water in all the oceans combined. So if that water came to the surface, it would be enough to flood the whole earth, to turn the whole earth into one big ocean to cover all the great mountains. I mean, nobody really picked up on the discovery. When I saw that, I was, uh, I was kind of relieved because that argument that I heard even in the Soviet school that I was growing up with that, you know, you don't have enough... Uh, you don't have enough water in the earth to cover the whole mountain as well. That argument is, it doesn't, it doesn't hold water anymore. <laughs> so uh, what's interesting, and that's uh, something that maybe you, know, you can have a challenge to your uh, Sunday school kids, uh, is the question, how long did the flood last? Anybody? 40 days? That was just a rain. It rained for 40 days. It rained for 40 days. But if you read carefully, Genesis says, says, and the waters increased for 150 days. So it rained for 40 days, waters increased for 150 days. Where did this increase come from, according to the book of Genesis? Fountains of the deep. The greatest fountains of the deep were opened. Okay, so the water was increasing from the fountains that were coming from under the ground. <coughs> And while it was raining for 40 days, it was increasing for 150 because of what was coming from the earth. So let's say, for example, there is a process that we still don't know and don't understand, was bringing all the water that scientists are now detecting to be present in the mantle of the unit of the earth, was bringing it to the ground. All that water would bring with it material from the mantle as well, and would deposit this material on top of the surface that was there before creating sedimentary layers that were a few miles thick. So when you read in the book of Genesis that God said, I will wipe out the, the earth with humanity, he literally meant meaning that the earth is going to be resurfaced. So what we, you know, sometimes we think about what was it like before the flood? Well, it was totally different earth. And it was the same planet but the surface was completely different. <coughs> and that would be responsible for the laying of the fossil evidence that we now find through these layers. It means that it was not in uh, over the millions of years, but could have been deposited very rapidly. And that movie, the documentary that I mentioned, is Genesis History, I think is making a very good case of that. But they didn't mention about the discovery of the water under, uh, under the crust, so that's something that we need to think about. So, if that is the case, the whole uh, history of the development of life has to be rewritten because you have to do a different type of dating. And I think we also can have a very good case to make about the, the story of the flood as actual event, a catastrophic event 
but that actually happened is the fact that the story of the flood is found in all the ancient folk tales throughout the world. It was not an event that touched somebody in Mesopotamia, just one part of the civilization of human race. It was a global event because of the... Uh, so I think recent science is at least making it quite possible that this did happen. Maybe they would not be able to prove <coughs> that it definitely happened, but again, some of the previous arguments uh, have to be revisited. Another interesting aspect of uh, uh, the current picture of the development of life is incredible variety of life forms. Uh, I mentioned before the calculation that physics uh, does with uh, uh, precise measurements and the idea that we need to understand how everything moves in a galaxy, the stars. Physics is able to measure things with uh, with biology, measurement is much more difficult because of the complexity of the structures. We only recently were able to uh, you know, parse the DNA, and even with that, we still have a lot of things that we will not understand, will not uh, know. But, for example, if we only went by the survival of the fittest principle, then you would think that there shouldn't be a variety of uh, beings, of animals, as, as we do observe. Uh, you know, people sometimes say, well, there are certain, you know, like, for example, beaks of the animals, of, of the birds, that are uh, specifically uh, kind of adapted to a certain way they feed themselves. Well, then, what, what's all about all the colors and all the other things that have, to, seem to be, have no re uh, relevance to the survival? What, what, where is this coming from? So, the science really doesn't have an answer to that. And they say, well, you know, uh, what was happening is the process of mutation. So you have process of accidental changes in the DNA that would lead to certain diversity of forms. And uh, uh, not too many people are uh, uh, answer, asking, well, were those mutations accidental? Or maybe they were purposeful. It's interesting kind of coincidental. A few weeks ago, they announced about the Nobel Prize in chemistry that was awarded just this year to a few American scientists. What they did, and it was kind of, uh, uh, you know, the headlines of this was uh, the novel research is proving the power of evolution. You know, when you read carefully, what they would call this is directed evolution. They were actually changing the environment in which certain organic, very complex molecules would uh, exist, and that would change certain properties of the molecules because of the change of the environment. So they did a directed change. It was purposeful. Is it possible also that in the story of creation, what we find is that God is purposefully changing through maybe even external environment, the DNA of the animals to have this variety of species that we have. It's not accidental. And this is as people of faith, we see this all the time. You know, we sometimes, what, what some person might think is an accident, we in this see providence. So again, uh, this is an interesting uh, aspect of, of the current understanding of evolution that doesn't rule out of this being directly created by God. Just the way that God created made it totally, not, not fully known by us, but at least we see certain development and certain uh, connection between the species that prove that there was a certain change that was maybe purposeful, not accidental. But, you know, the, the biggest problem, I think, with the current understanding of, uh, of, of scientific Development, significant sense of development, is the law of entropy. Uh, it's a very fundamental law, very fundamental principle of, uh, of, 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 of the world, the way the world works. We all know it very well in our lives. It, taught, it says that if there is any kind of order, the natural tendency of all the processes in the world is for, the, for order to go into disorder. So there's a little illustration. Uh, two gases are separated by a partition. This presents a very simple order. They're kind of ordered in their own chambers. If you remove the partition, the gases will mix, and there is no chance in the world that they can go back to this state without an external force changing and putting them into this state. A very simple principle, we know this because no matter what we do in life, yes, whatever order we create, it turns into disorder. Now, quite often our life is not so much about creating new things, it's about maintaining old things. And we know it even by our own life, you know, we get old, 
And uh, what we used to do, so what we used to be in a good order, starts to get into disrepair, and we need to keep fixing it through medicine and, and other things. Um, so how is it possible that just somehow order emerges by itself? Because when we're talking about complex molecular structure of organic matter, that's a very complex thing that is just impossible to expect to just happen by itself. And this is what really kind of surprises me about modern science. I mentioned before there are certain processes in astrophysics that scientists do not understand and they assign these mysterious concepts of dark matter and dark energy. They say something is out there. We see the effect of that. We don't know what it is. We hope that we won't they will find it. But uh, let's at least put a label on it and see there is something that we still need to explain. Why wouldn't those people in biology, those who are studying evolution, say, you know what, we have processes that go fly in the face of the second law of thermodynamics. According to thermodynamics, the science that we know, this should not exist, but it does. So obviously there is something that makes it happen. Let's call it life force, you know, for the Star Wars fans. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be yet labeled God, but at least to recognize that there is something that is responsible specifically for the creation of organic matter and for creation of life in general. And uh, let's maybe study this. And, but at least to admit, just like we can admit to dark matter and dark energy, let's admit to some kind of a life force that is in existence that we see the effects of, we still don't understand it. Scientists, I think, are really afraid of that because then it will be labeled as, you know, Bible-believing <laughs> people. Um, so those are some things that I wanted to share, like on a scientific perspective. The rest of the talk, I would like to spend in discussing the actual biblical text. And the reason why I think it's very important is because and we quite often talk about problems in science. We can also turn to ourselves and look, is there a problem with the biblical text of the first uh, chapter of Genesis? Do we understand this? How does it line up with the current picture of the development of the world? Do we uh, want to say that the biblical text is somehow outdated? Because when you look at it, it's uh, very geocentric, yes? It was very easy to work with for those people that thought that Earth is either flat or that the Earth is the center of the universe and everything else is revolves around the Earth. I mean, that was kind of fit that paradigm very well. But ever since Copernic, I think we have more and more difficulty with reading the biblical narrative of creation. I just want to emphasize, by the way, not just biblical account, not just the fact that the Bible talks about the creation by God, but actual biblical text. What does the Bible say? I think it's a very important and grave, I would say, challenge for us Orthodox people because always in a patristic literature, for example, the text of the Bible is, is a canon, is what, by what you measure other things. It was not questioned. Again, not just a general account, but the actual text. Are we at the point and that we can maybe kind of say, well, maybe not everything in the Bible is uh, correct, or at least from our perspective. And I think that there is a tendency that we see with some people doing that. Usually they would say, well, you know, the text of the Bible was given to the people in ancient times that imagined Earth to be flat, you have a big dome, you have a hemisphere above above the Earth. So, you know, they, the text had to reflect that. Well, what does it mean to us? Does it mean that they this is no longer text that we can take seriously because we are more enlightened and we know that the, the structure of the universe much much, much better? Because where that's leading us is that if we start doubting the text of the Bible, especially in such an important part as the first chapter of Genesis, the story of creation, then we can start questioning other things. Maybe other things in the Bible are also the product of that time in which this text was written. What about the Apostle Paul, for example, having his judgment of homosexuality or the relationship between a man and a woman? 
I think there are some people that are quite comfortable saying, even though I'm a Christian and I believe uh, the Bible in general, but I think this part is really, you know, the product of the time. Therefore, it's no longer applicable to us. You see the danger that this is leading to? So, my question is, is it possible to take the text of the Bible seriously and to say that it is infallible, which I firmly believe, but to be able to put in kind of correspondence with the current picture that I've described before. I believe it can be done, and it's something that unfortunately you can't go back to the fathers to, to get help with, because they obviously didn't know about the Big Bang, about the Tree of Life, uh, about sedimentary layers. Uh, so we are at the position, point in the church, where we have to develop. And what I'm about to present is something that I don't want to claim is an orthodox perspective on this. And I see this quite often with some people that try to really create, you know, present an orthodox perspective on some kind of challenging question of today. Uh, because then kind of that's, I think, claiming a little bit too much. Because orthodox perspective has to develop over time, maybe over even centuries. What I hope to do is to maybe make a little contribution to that, uh, to present my perspective, perspective of an Orthodox Christian, of how this conflict can be eliminated between the stories in the Bible and what we uh, see in science. I'm going to give it to your judgment. I would love your feedback, uh, and hopefully maybe it will help contribute somehow with the formation of this uh, Orthodox perspective on how the creation can be understood, the text of the story of creation can be understood in the light of uh, current uh, scientific discoveries. Before I do that, I do want to go back to this question of uh, the day of creation. Because I think it's very illuminating in this task that is before us. Because the day of creation what often is taking us a literal 24-hour day. We have some, even among the Orthodox, people that would say that, yes, the day of creation has to be 24-hour days because the Bible says so. Yes? Uh, at the same time, what is the, when is it that the day could actually be measured in the story of creation? Fourth day. Fourth day. So the fourth day, God creates sun and moon to measure the days. So before the fourth day, there wasn't a concept of 24-hour day. So what about those first three days, first, second, third, before sun and moon are created that measure the 24-hour day cycle? Uh, obviously, those days are different. So when we're talking about day of creation, we're talking about something that the scripture is trying to tell us is similar to the day that we experience it now, but yet something that's different. In our understanding, in our Orthodox worldview, it's called symbol or an image. Something that we can have a concept of that actually talks to us about some deeper spiritual reality that is something different yet connected. <coughs> so the symbol is that which connects two realities, that which connects that which can be seen with that can be which which, which is unseen. So if we think about the scripture trying to present to us this idea of God working likens, it, it likens this uh, process to a period of days. Day is what? Day is when you get up, you do a certain amount of work, and you go back to sleep. This is what we're familiar with. This is what God does. How long that takes in our earthly years is irrelevant. Well, the most important thing is that it represents that period of creation in the concept of a day. So we have to think about this iconographic representation. The scripture cannot be understood without uh, re reference to this symbolical interpretation. There are, there are, and this is where I think we have to be uh, and dis have a discernment. There are certain things in the Bible that are literal. For example, when we hear a story of Abraham, we have to believe that this is the man that actually lived, and this is the actual story of his life. This is what happened to him. When we are talking about uh, other things in the Bible, 
that we have to understand. This is symbolic. For example, you know, the book of Revelation says, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns, seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. Obviously, it's a symbol. So when we're talking about the first chapter of the book of the Bible and the end of the book of the Bible, they have to be some connection between them. These are the things that are presented to us in a symbolical way. We need to learn how to read those symbols and to discern what is literal from what is symbolic. So this is the question that we actually need to discuss and need to see. So when I'm mentioning the day of creation, I propose to think of it as an icon. Our day is an icon of the day of creation. The day of creation is not a 24-hour day, but it's a symbol to that reality in which God works. There are other things at work in the story of creation that are invisible and maybe incomprehensible to us that have to be expressed to us in a set of symbols. And yet there are also other things like animals that have to be understood literally. So to have a discernment about which things are understood in one way or which things can be understood in another way. And uh, you know, we'll be running ahead. You know, we need to have a correlation between the history of the development of the universe that I mentioned, the Big Bang, and the story of creation. So the question that I have is, when is, in this story of creation, is the Big Bang happening? I suggest that the Big Bang is actually the third day of creation. Third, not the first. And I will, I will, I will get to that as, as I'm talking about the text of the Bible. So what we have is a text that is written, that is given to humanity at a certain time. But I'm mentioning humanity, not just people of those you know, thousands of years ago, during the time of Exodus, possibly Moses, but it was given then, but it was given to us as well because it was written down and it's passed from generation to generation. The challenge that God had inspiring the text was to inspire it in such a way that it could be both read by those people and read by us as infallible, and to express certain things that maybe those people didn't understand that we understand now, and still be perfectly correct. That's why I suggest that the Big Bang should be positioned at the third day of creation. And uh, let's see whether I am able to convince you that that's its proper place. So if the Big Bang doesn't happen until the third day of creation, the first and the second day of creation take place outside of the reality as we know. Therefore, those are symbols. They have to be understood as symbols. So what are those first and second day of creation? What are the descriptions and how can it all make sense for us? Let's begin. I chose this illustration for this part of the talk, of the mosaics from the Basilica of St. Mark in Venice. At the entrance in the Basilica, there is a dome that has the depiction of the story of creation. What's fascinating is that it's uh, actually done in a early, I would say, early Byzantine style. Even though it was actually made in the 11th century, uh, most likely it was a replica of something much earlier, uh, pre-iconoclastic iconography. And you can tell by the way that the, uh, the, the, the depiction is just an art style, is pre-iconoclastic, it's actually the Roman antiquity style. So the first day, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness over the abyss, and the Spirit of God was covering all about the waters. So what the story of creation tells us is that the beginning is God is bringing heaven and earth into existence. And uh, the first state, the earth is invisible without light and void, meaning that it's actually unfinished, it's not shaped, it's amorphous. It's very important for the earth to be amorphous at this point because from it, later on, certain structures have to emerge. The structures of the planets, 
of life. And uh, if it wasn't amorphous in the beginning, those structures wouldn't be able to come about. So the fact that the, 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 the matter is amorphous is described in this uh, liking it to the water. So if you think about all of these being images, water is an image, our water is an image, a symbol of the state of the universe as it was in the beginning. Uh, abyss is also an image of something that was in the beginning. We understand the waters, but what is the abyss? What is the scripture talking about? Did God create the abyss? That's, a, that's an interesting question. He created heaven and earth. How did the abyss, what, what is it doing here? How did it come about? Did God create it? I think abyss is something that is fundamental to a vision of the universe, spiritual vision of the universe. And to help us understand the nature of the abyss, I would like you to read this quote from St. Athanasius. In the book on the Incarnation, he talks about humanity, but in reality it applies to all of creation. He says, because of the transgression of the commandment, the human beings are turning back to their natural state. What is the natural state? Corruption. The natural state of a human being is the corruption. Since they were brought by God into existence out of nothing, so also without God they will return back into nothing in the course of time. The abyss is the ability of the creation to fall into nothingness. And the first day of creation describes it very powerfully by saying the Spirit of God is hovering above. So as you're moving away from God, you're moving into the abyss. You're going into that from which you came from. Nothingness. Because we were all called from non-existence into being. God created the world out of nothing. And therefore without God, it goes back into that nothing. The amazing thing about this is that this is the second law of thermodynamics. Any order naturally has a tendency to go into disorder. Therefore, what we study in physics is a direct consequence of this world being brought from non-existence into being. It's a very interesting connection, very powerful, I think, connection where you think about the discovery of science and then something that is biblical. Why is it also important? Is that for us to have eternal life, we have to be connected with God. And that connection has to be eternal. That's why St. Athanasius starts his book on the Incarnation with this quote. He says that because of the Incarnation of Christ, of the Son of God, God coming and uniting himself with the universe, there is a part of the universe that will never go back into nothingness. As long as we are with Christ, and with Christ, we are connected with God. We have eternal life. So the abyss, again, is that ability of creation to fall back into non-existence where it came from. And then God said, let there be light. The light of the first day of creation, before the sun and the moon appear has to be also understood in a symbolical way. It's a spiritual light. It's not the light that can be seen with the eyes. It's the light that is the light of God. Apostle Paul talks about this. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In the baptismal service, we say, you brought this your servant into the world and shown him physical light. May he also become partaker of the spiritual light. So the light of the first day of creation is the light of God that comes into the world to enlighten those who are in the world. And that light is good. It's 
not the light of electromagnetic radiation that we perceive with our eyes. It's the light that is perceived by our heart. Next day, day two, second day, very, very challenging part of the story of the creation. I think it's completely misunderstood quite often because usually it's kind of written off as the kind of a wrong perception about the state of the universe that the ancients had. God created the firmament because they thought that what we have above us is actually firm. Something that you can hang the star and the moon and the sun on. And it made sense to the ancient people. Until we discovered that actually if you go up in the rocket, you will not hit the firmament. Instead you will go into vastness of space, it is dark. I think a lot of people now have a problem with this, uh, with this day of creation. They're, well, you know, this was for those people, written for those people. The whole day of creation is dedicated to creating a firmament. Got to be big. Got to be something very, very important, something we're missing. Then God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were above the firmament from the waters which were uh, below the firmament. And it was so. What water are we talking about? Now this is before the beginning of the perceptible world as we see it now. Again, these are symbols. The state of the material existence has two sides to it. There is proper material and there is also spiritual. Because spiritual has effect on the material. They actually interact with each other. They touch each other. So what God is doing on the second day is creating this dividing point. This partition that makes these two parts of reality distinct and yet have a boundary between them. And uh, if we think that we know what this water under the heaven is like, this is our visible world, the world that we can see. What is that which is above the firmament? A quote from Blessed Augustine, which actually also repeated in many uh, places in Eastern part of this fellow. The firmament of heaven separated the corporeal matter of visible things from the incorporeal matter of invisible things. The matter was separated by the interposition of the firmament, so that the lower matter is that of bodies, and the higher matter that of souls. If we think about it this way, the firmament is that which divides two sides of reality and runs through all of us. This is what both separates and unites spiritual and material in every human being. I would even go as far as to say that those out-of-body experiences that people have when they go and they see the light at the end of the tunnel, that's the opening of that entrance into that firmament and reaching out to that spiritual world. Because that's something that is testified by so many uh, people that I think we can actually talk about as some kind of a medical, medical fact. So what, we are, what we're talking about here is the connection that is not so much firm in the sense of hard surface as something that is flexible. Yes, the heavens can be opened. We hear it from the scripture. We, he, we, we, we sing it in church, God bowed down the heavens and came down to us. Yes, the heavens can become closer to us and they can become further away from us. 
book of Isaiah says, he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent, something that is firm and yet flexible. The book of Revelation, that the heaven receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. So think about a curtain in the church that separates the two parts of the church, spiritual, that which is heaven, from the material, and at the same time allows for the unity of both, distinction and the unity. So sometimes the heaven can be open, and is depicted on the icons. For example, on the icon of the remission. You see that Christ is coming from heaven. It's not coming from somewhere high, but it's opening right here. Right in our midst. This permit of heaven becomes open, and people see the other side they didn't see before. Um, and yet at the same time, God says, waters above the firmament, that means that waters of the spiritual world, and the waters that are under the firmament, the reason for that distinction above and under is to recognize the priority, the hierarchy. Just like we saw on the first day of creation, spirit hovering above, meaning that which is above is higher. The first, second day of creation gives us a goal. It tells us where to stretch to. And ever since then, the heaven that we see, the sky, becomes an image, an icon of that thirst and longing for that which is above us spiritually. Third day. This is where we come into something that I would say more tangible, something that we can have maybe better experience of and better understanding. And God let, said, let the water which is under the firmament gather into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. I'm not sure how many of you reading this part of Genesis uh, recognize that it wasn't so. Did you ever notice that? What did, what did God tell the water to do? The water should gather into one place. When you read the next verse, and the waters under the firmament were gathered into their places. What's going on? Why is water not listening to God? <laughs> or is it, is it listening, actually? Because what God said was, by the word of God, giving the water certain abilities they didn't have before, specifically gravitational force. That's why I believe that the third day of creation is a big bang. This is when things start coalesce. This is when the universe, the visible universe, acquires certain properties, certain forces, we call physical forces, that enable this water to start gathering. So the, the property is what? The property is together into one place, but as a result, the water gathers into many places. And we have the beauty of the created universe. I'm sure how many of you know this image? It's called Deep Field Image of Hubble. Because each of these, what we think stars, are actually galaxies. This Billions and billions of stars. You can see that their shapes are not dots, but they are oval. So this is many, many million light years away from us. It could happen on the scale of the universe and at large. The gravitational force is what brings the matter together. It also happens here on our Earth. So as the Word of God came into the material existence, and, and you material existence with this force together into one place, we have the variety of landscapes and the beauty of the, what we perceive as the created world. It happens sort of by itself, but at the same time by the word of God that gives Earth these abilities. What else about the third day? 
Then, let, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the third day. God gives another power to the earth. Before that, there was a power to gather into one place. Now it's a power to produce organic matter. Earth is, the, is what produces organic matter, but it's done according to the seed. So if you think about the seed that is falling in the ground, it has a DNA in it, according to which the earth constructs same seed, same kind. The seed dies. But from it, the earth constructs something new. So the earth has this power. And uh, one of the, I believe, stumbling blocks of the uh, story of creation is the fact that all this is happening before the creation of the sun and the moon. Again, how could vegetable life exist before the creation of the sun and the moon? Well, this is special of the sun, yes? The source of energy that is necessary for life. And I suggest that the way it can be explained that most likely vegetable life existed before the creation of our solar system. That is a property that the Earth has throughout our universe, throughout our galaxy and other systems that we have. And again, the recent, there was a recent discovery that detected complex organic molecules in the interstellar gas. Molecules that normally would be the product of uh, organic life would be detected elsewhere. It's very interesting. So what is that? By the way, this uh, image of the days of creation. You see the angelic beings <coughs> that, uh, are representing. So each day, the frescoes, the mosaics, would add another angelic being. And I'm not sure if they look like 24-hour days. <laughs> Again, people in the past had very great ability to recognize symbols and to understand that what we're talking about is symbolic. Fourth day, then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven for illumination to divide day from night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. That's the creation of a solar system. That's about four or five billion years ago, according to the current model, which can change. But this is when God made a special creative effort. Our Earth and Sun coalesced according to the book of Genesis, not by accident. It was a directed effort of God. And some people say, well, you know, you've been pushing it too much, yes? Obviously, caused by accident. You know, uh, when we're talking about somebody who is an atheist, who is arguing that all this happened by accident, on top of all the other accidents, like creation of the human life, what is the accident of the sun and the moon being the same exact size from our perspective? Yeah. Think about it, we have a natural satellite that is positioned just at exact distance from the Earth, that it can actually do this. <laughs> <laughs> If it was just a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, it was a little bit further away, closer away to, to, the, to the surface of the Earth, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be seeing this. What are the chances? Yes? <laughs> so I think there are too many, too many accidents on the Earth. <laughs> I think there's all, it's all a chance. Fifth day. The fifth day, God said, let the waters bring forth creatures with living souls, and let birds fly above the earth. And it was so. Again, I have a challenge. Was it so or not? You remember on the third day, God tells the earth to bring forth grass and trees. And earth brought forth grass and trees. Will the water do the same thing? Will it bring forth creatures with living soul? Anybody remembers the text? 
and God made. The waters don't have the power to do this. God makes a creative effort to bring forth that which has life. The soul of the living creatures come from God. The waters participate in it in a sense of perhaps creating some cellular organisms. But the breath of life is something that only God can, can do, can give. So what we see here is the unique act of creation that God is doing himself. He's participating in it purposefully. <coughs> and we can see this in a special blessing. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. The animal life has a certain participation in the life of God. And because of this is blessed. The trees and the grass were not called blessed. The earth, the sun and the moon were not called blessed. The organic life that has living soul that comes from the creative hands of God called blessed. And that's why that life is sacred. And we understand the sacredness of life was there in the beginning when God, after he created human being, and all the animals says, to you, the, the grass and the trees will be for food. When we eat vegetables, we derive the strength of life from the earth. And we kind of go back to this every time we fast. So God, after the flood, will tell people to eat meat. And uh, we have to kind of reflect on that. What could have been the reason for that? So eating meat is not a sin. It is a direct permission from God. But it's important for us to remember the sacredness of life as God created in the beginning. It is sacred because it's blessed. And then we have the sixth day. Different kinds of animals are created on the sixth day. And what is their purpose? What makes them distinct from the animals of the fifth day? You cannot help but to think where is so leading to. Man will be created on the sixth day as well. We are part of this group. We are connected with them. Even though creation of man is a unique effort by God to create a being in his image and likeness, he still displays the connection with those animals by them and us being created on the same day of creation. So what is it that distinguishes these animals from the animals of the fifth day? They both have living soul. Breath of life. They all have breath of life. Birds have breath of life. Honor. They're land. What that? The birds are also in the land. Reptiles are also in the land. Yeah. They are mammals. mammals. They are mammals. And we are mammals. And I'm not saying that we are animal, but I'm saying that we have part of animal nature in us as well. We are mammals. And what is the reason for us to be mammals? Well, that's a good question. What is it that made it necessary for God to say, now I want to create a living being that can carry a child in the womb? Because God himself has to become incarnate. He has to be carried as in the ark, in the womb of the Theotokos. It would not be proper for the creation of God to happen to a being that is laying eggs. Think about it. Right. It had to be a being that accepts the life of God within. And that's how incarnation is taking place. By the way, do you see the heavens opened? Also on this, the same image. The heavens touch, come down, and touch the womb of the Theotokos. Open. 
So, the creation of man. And the six days are there. Day to day, forced for speech. All of the days are participating in the creation of man because man, according to patristic understanding, is a microcosm. In him is everything that was created before. And the creation of man is such a subject that I could have another lecture. We're running out of time. But before I conclude, I do want to just go over the days of creation one more time and let's see how they correspond to what we have inside. Each day has to have a reflection in our spiritual life. What is it? The first day of creation, we are able to perceive the spiritual light, the light of the first day of creation. Second day, we can participate in both heaven and earth, in the spiritual reality and the material reality. We are the point where they touch. And we also have a vertical, we also have a goal to aim higher. The waters that are above the firmament is our goal. We are able to grow like plants We have that ability. And also to have seed and fruit, both material and spiritual. And for a while I was thinking about this puzzle. The church teaches us that in the whole of creation, only human being is created in the image and likeness of God. Not even the angels. What is it that angels lack that we have? Being. But They're God is not material. material. But God is not material. Paulus says that we give life to something else the angels don't. We can have a child, just like God can have a child, the Son of God. <coughs> God begets, and we can beget as well. That's what makes us in a true image, something that the angels cannot do. <coughs> and we all can also have a seed and fruit that is spiritual. So God sows a seed, the sower. The devil also sows the seed. We can have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And people can also be sons of the devil, as Christ would call some. You're the sons of the evil one, and you do his work. We can comprehend that which we see the rational creation the laws of physics. That's the fourth day of creation. The ability to comprehend the world <coughs> and all the glory that God imbued it with through the laws of nature. We can participate in the blessedness and sacredness of life of the fifth day of creation. Those animals that were created on the fifth day, they're blessed, they're sacred, and that's what we have as well. And the sixth day, we can have an inbound of life Ability to become temples of God. That's what the sixth day of creation gives us. And ultimately, the seventh day of creation, we can find rest in God. That's the final goal of what it means to have eternal blessedness. I just want to conclude with this mosaic. God blesses the seventh day. That's our ultimate goal. So, okay. Is that what I... Thank you to say. Uh, well, welcome to the